Good afternoon and welcome to the Institute for Human Sciences for probably our, our first event of the uh, fall uh, of this year. Um, I'm very glad and honored that we kick it off with the first uh, Europe's Futures uh, Fellowship Colloquium. Uh, very briefly, for those of you who don't know, this is a project uh, at the Institute for Human Sciences uh, which is done in strategic partnership with the uh, Vienna-based Erste Stiftung, um, subtitled Ideas for Action. Uh, we rounded off our first year last June, and uh, the way it works is that we invite uh, fellows to spend uh, the year uh, on this project. Uh, during the month of September, they are in residence here at the Institute, and for the rest of the year, they are non-residents because they all have their day jobs in uh, various European uh, cities working on specific projects. And uh, the colloquia that will be here uh, every Monday will endeavor to uh, present the individual projects that they're working on. Of course, we'll have a number of events uh, in September that are related to uh, the project, but also during the course of the year, we will meet in conferences and workshops, and uh, we will this year uh, introduce a blog that will appear weekly, and uh, we'll kick it off on uh, Monday. Uh, several of the fellows have already uh, sent in their first pieces, and so we hope that also uh, that we'll be doing a podcast uh, with the fellows. So in tune with the times uh, and the uh, needs for impact uh, of this fellowship, uh, we will uh, be doing a number of other things, but to be announced also later. So I'm very happy to uh, introduce two uh, first fellows uh, uh, this Monday. Uh, the first is uh, Grigory Mesezhnikov, who comes to us from Bratislava. Uh, <laughs> A warm welcome to Grigori, who will be the first one to present. He's a political scientist, has uh, worked on all things uh, related to uh, transition uh, politics, uh, to democracy and its challenges. Uh, he just uh, gave me uh, his latest uh, production, a co-edited volume with uh, Jacek Kuharczyk on uh, The Phantom Menace, The Politics and Policies of Migration in Central and Eastern Europe. This will be in the library uh, in a few days. Uh, today he will talk about uh, illiberalism in this part of the world, uh, the case of Slovakia in particular. I think he has a PowerPoint uh, presentation. Uh, each of the fellows has about an hour, and uh, at the end of it, uh, you will all be invited to join us for uh, our usual uh, wine and cheese uh, downstairs. Uh, in our um, refectory. Uh, I'd also like to mention that this is being uh, broadcast live through uh, YouTube and uh, will also be up uh, on the YouTube, uh, IWM YouTube site for you to watch uh, to um, uh, find out those details that you missed as you were thinking of something else during uh, the talk or the discussion. Um, I'd also like to mention that all in all we have eight fellows uh, this year. I'd just like to mention them uh, by name. I'll introduce them, of course, one by one as we have the, the colloquia or the events. Uh, we have Nicole Koenig here from the Institute Jacques Delors in Paris, Peter Kreko from Political Capital in Budapest, Nicolo Milanese, who will be presenting just now, so I'll introduce him separately, Alida Vracic uh, from Sarajevo, uh, in the back of the room, Berndt Marin, who is a Viennese-based uh, social scientist. Um, we also have uh, Isabel Ioannides, who's uh, from Cyprus originally, but she's Brussels-based, uh, linked to both uh, the university there and uh, to uh, uh, European institutions. Um, she is speaking today at a conference on a new start for EU foreign policy. Uh, that is why uh, she is not with us, and I'm missing someone. 
<laughs> Leszek Jaszewski, thank you very much for the souffleur. Uh, and uh, he is from from Łódź in Poland, where he runs a festival called the not the Hunger Games, but the Freedom Games. And uh, he is involved in that, so he be he will be here with us on Monday. So without further ado, Grigory, please uh, take uh, the floor. Thank you very much, Ivan, for this kind introduction. Really, I'm very pleased to be here. It's my premiere in Institute for Human Sciences, so really I'm very thankful to the Institute that I was admitted to this uh, program, uh, Europe's Future, and I will work uh, on uh, the topic which I consider as a very serious uh, in my country, but also in Central Europe and broadly, probably, we are now witnessing uh, this phenomenon uh, in, the, in the whole Europe, uh, strengthening positions of extreme parties, radical parties, and in Slovakia since 2016, it's really inseparable part of uh, party politics and uh, public discourse. But I would start probably with some positive remarks. Because uh, I came from the country, not v very remote from, uh, from Austria, from Slovakia, which is mentioned today as an example of very positive developments. So positive dynamism in recent two years. Of course, we know that uh, it started with a horrible event. And after this event, which provoked mass manifestations of people, rallies around the country, in Bratislava, in regional district cities, there were authors which compare this ex civic explosion with the Velvet Revolution uh, that since uh, November 1989, Slovakia didn't witness such mass manifestations and really the positive dynamism was launched and there were some sequences of this dynamism. First, of course, uh, changes in personal composition of the government, prime minister resigned, minister of interior resigned, some high police officer resigned. Uh, coalition remained the same, but nevertheless, uh, the personal changes were very important. Then, of course, there were some other sequences of these changes, changes uh, uh, investigation of the murder and some other criminal offenses, which brought some suspects to imprisonment. Uh, then, uh, local elections with uh, relatively good results, uh, that many people who were involved in this civic movement for decent Slovakia uh, and civic initiatives, lo local civic initiatives, some of them uh, were involved in electoral activities, some even were elected to the local organs of cell government. Then in March, uh, person who symbolized, I think, uh, symbolized these wishes of changes. Zuzana Chaputova was elected as a president with the support of almost whole opposition parties, pro-democratic opposition parties, uh, and with support from many public intellectuals, civic activists. So she really symbolized uh, that time this motion, movement from, uh, let's say, the state of injustice in the governance with some problems, irregularities to the more clean politics. She presented her vision of uh, the decent Slovakia. So, of course, it was very positively assessed by domestic actors, by uh, foreign observers. And uh, European elections also a couple of weeks ago, I think the domination of dominance of pro-European parties was absolutely obvious. So this positive dynamism is evident, but I think that the picture is much more colorful. It's not only about consolidation of positions of these, I would say, liberal democratic forces, but uh, there are some other expectation of changes, and the proponents of these expectations and proponents of these proposed changes, they, are, they belong to another societal camp. So from one side, consolidation of this pro-democratic camp, on the, both on the level of political elites and, and citizens, voters. At the same time, consolidation of positions uh, of maybe to describe them in more known uh, terms, Slovak alt-right. And I mean, what are the indications of this? Uh, first, 
and it happened several uh, years ago. Slovak right-wing extremist party, People's Party, Avoy Slovakia, Kotleba, the name of the leader of, this, of the party and part of the name of the party, penetrated into Slovak parliament uh, three years ago and constantly they are, they are strengthening their positions. Then in presidential elections, which happened uh, happily led to uh, election of maybe the best possible candidate, candidate in post-communist uh, history of Slovakia for this position, uh, won. But uh, the representatives of uh, so-called Slovak alt-right, both, both gentlemen, the former uh, chair of Supreme Court, Mr. Harabin, and Kotleba, the leader of this party, together, they gained more votes than the second mainstream pro-European candidate in this election. So only because uh, these two gentlemen failed to come to agreement about their common approach, otherwise, one of them would be in the second, uh, in the second round. And in the European elections, which also we consider as a relatively results uh, successful for democracy, that uh, dominant parties are pro-democratic parties, but this fascist party delegated two persons in the European Parliament, so first time in uh, post-communist history of Slovakia since uh, European elections started to be uh, held in Slovakia, representatives of extremist party are uh, now in European Parliament. So how to treat this? From one side, positive development. From another side, we see that some very disturbing trends and facts, uh, facts on, on the scene. My project is about uh, one narrow aspect, but I think very important aspect of rising the right extremism in Slovakia, but I think that in some points, uh, it also it can be relevant for other countries. So I, my hy hypothesis is that not only the ethnopolitics and social deprivations, which are frequently mentioned, and of course, I will also show you some facts in my slide presentation, which uh, are confirming this, that these two factors are very important for uh, rising the right wing extremism. But I think that uh, it's not enough for explanation why just 30 years after uh, in, so in Czechoslovakia Velvet Revolution, after the start of the uh, transformation process, right-wing extremism, extremists are gaining so prominent position in, uh, in the politics, uh, in public discourse. Uh, so, and my hyp hypothesis is that a part of these two factors, also something substantial is uh, boosting or energizing or encouraging uh, uh, activities of right-wing extremism. And uh, this factor is uh, just this illiberal uh, regression of democracy, which official uh, title of my project, illiberal regression of democracy as an opportunity for political extremism. So all these irregularities, failures in democratic governance, uh, insufficient fight against corruption, uh, competition between liberal democrats and mainstream populists, in which mainstream populists, who, who are not extremists, but they are trying to weaken pro-democratic, liberal democratic, uh, democratically oriented political forces, they are creating better conditions for the extremists. So it will be uh, the output of my project, substantial paper explaining this, our institute, several years, uh, measured the quality of democracy in the country and uh, coincidentally a big part of this period of time which we analyzed it was a time of uh, ruling coalitions formed by mainstream populists national populists social populists so we uh, elaborated a methodology in which we every quarter so there were quarterly reports in which we measured and released uh, rating of quality of democracy in the country. So now we have some, I have some good uh, background, uh, factual background, how in the situation in which right-wing extremists were in marginal position, how they succeeded to gain the support. And just to remind you, uh, looking back to the whole uh, three decades of transformation, in Slovakia, if we are speaking about ethnopolitics and social deprivation factor, that uh, at the beginning of transformation really 
Ethnopolitics were absolutely over dominating the separatist movement in Slovakia led to uh, separation of Slovakia from, from Czech Republic, so the solution of Czechoslovakia, the social de de deprivation, uh, uh, the uh, launch of economic reforms re really brought big problems to society, 20% unemployment, many other indications of really worsened social and economic situation, and that time in the country, uh, right-wing extremists simply, they, they existed as a, an opinion stream, but uh, it wasn't politically relevant stream. And today, in much uh, more better social conditions with ethnic politics, which is of course still very, uh, very uh, present in this course, but nevertheless, uh, uh, comparing to the situation, let's say 25 years ago, really, uh, big differences. So now probably I will show you, I will start with the probably most disturbing, most disturbing slide, which is confirming what I told about rising uh, the right-wing extremism in Slovakia. Yeah. Don't worry, my present, PowerPoint presentation will be short. Maybe it will be seven, eight slides, no more. Maybe nine. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no more than nine. Okay. So look to this chart. There is a electoral statistics, and you can see how uh, after 2016 or since 2016. Uh, right-wing extremist party, what I uh, mentioned, uh, it's uh, Slovak uh, People's Party, Avoy Slovakia, Marian Kotleba, Kotleba's party. How they really succeeded to gain substantial uh, public support? They participated two times in elections to the parliament and with insignificant results. And in 2016, you see that really uh, they gained very substantial support, 8%. Then in European uh, elections to European Parliament, first time they participated in 2014, and they really, you see that they have got more than, I think, 12 times more votes in these elections. So elections which were held several uh, weeks ago. In the regional elections, uh, for them, uh, 102,000 uh, people voted. It's very important also to take into consideration the difference in uh, voter uh, turnout. So it means that, for example, in these regional elections, uh, uh, approximately half of the potential electorate voted for their candidates to regional governors. So with uh, almost 30% turnout, it means that they have more than 200, maybe 240,000 voters. And when in 2000, uh, 2017, uh, Marian Kotleba was defeated as a regional because he was, in 2013, he was coincidentally elected to a uh, position of regional governor, uh, governor in Banska Bistrica, but he was defeated in 2017 by the common candidate of the uh, all democratic parties, let's say. And some uh, some very optimistic voices at times uh, said that, look, Kotleba's party is uh, constantly weakening. But uh, I think that they simply didn't uh, realize uh, the difference in the regional elections. And uh, I think it's very important for an anal analysis to take into consideration the real statistics, the real votes. So it means that this party is still strong. This party is, I think, today even electorally stronger than in 2016, and this party is definitely going to be again elected in, in national parliament and probably even with a better result. So it means that now they became uh, integral part of party system. They are in a very strange situation. Officially, they are not recognized by any democratic parties, but there are some political games which are giving them, maybe not leverage, but uh, giving them positions in which they are more relevant. And of course, it's a problem, but a bit later about this. 
Now, uh, here you can see some factors which uh, are supportive for rising right-wing extremism in Slovakia. Some of them, I think, they are similar or they can be relevant for other countries, but some are very specific. Uh, Multi-ethnic composition of the population, dramatic social situation of Roma minority, I think that it's typical for some other Central European countries, but uh, some, uh, some differences in history of the country, for example, uh, ideological and political legacy of domestic fascism in the 20th century. This party is openly admiring the pro-Nazi regime of uh, President Tiso during the Second World War. Then there are very visible revisionist elements uh, within the established historical science and the public discourse, and it's not related only to the history of Second World War, which is very important. But, uh, and by the way, this revisionism started to be presented in the public, public discourse earlier than uh, Kotleba's party became a parliamentary party. The first big wave of, of this revisionist Revisionism uh, had a place during the government of uh, Smer Party, Fico, Robert Fico, Vladimir Mechar, and Jan Slota, the Slovak National Party. I'm, I'm speaking about this deep, I would say, historic revisionism, uh, not the Second World War, but uh, interpretation of ethnogenesis of Slovak nation, the concept that uh, there was so-called old Slovaks in 9th, 10th century, that Great Moravia was in reality, the Slovak kingdom and so on. So these elements were present and uh, I think for some groups of the population, uh, it was quite appealing. Then of course, negative effect of uh, countries isolation uh, on the population's value, value orientations uh, and uh, eroding consensus of mainstream politicians on prevention of extremists from participation in politics. So uh, after, uh, Kotleba's party entered the parliament. It was, of course, shock. It was shock for liberal democrats. It was shock for mainstream populists. And somehow, a few months after the election, elections really, uh, even it was uh, the ju justification of the creation of a uh, ruling coalition, which still is operating, which is quite a strange mixture of self-proclaimed uh, social democrats, uh, Civic Party of Slovak and Hungarians and Radical Slovak Nationalist National Party. But they came to the conclusion that what, one of the reasons which they presented to the population why they agreed to form this government was fight against fascism. Yeah, the fascism was mentioned directly and today it's, uh, I think it's a common sense in the interpretation of this party, journalists, scholars, politicians, that uh, this party is considered as a fascist. So somehow at least uh, uh, the naming of the phenomenon is adequate. And then some external uh, factors. First, of course, refugee crisis, which uh, was used by Kotleba's party quite paradoxically uh, before elections 2016. It was probably half a year in which migration issue was the main topic in public discourse and main topic in electoral campaign, but he wasn't the main actor of this spreading the hysteria, anti-refugee, anti-migration hysteria. It was Mr. Fico, Prime Minister Fico uh, that time, who was the most proactive fighter against illegal or legal any migration, but at the end, the voters uh, considered more authentic uh, Kotleba's party than Smer party. Smer party, uh, the electoral gain was 18% less than in previous elections, but because these two smaller parties, which I mentioned, uh, Slovak Hungarian party, Civic party, and, uh, and Slovak National party, Fico succeeded to form uh, third time the, gov the government. So, and then another exter external factors, which I think, not only me, but also some of my colleagues, that this Russian authoritarian influence uh, also uh, somehow helped to boost support among, among uh, uh, the voters, potential voters of Kotleba's party, especially these narratives. These narratives which, uh, and by the way, uh, Kotleba's party and some other extreme right nationalist smaller groups, either polit with political ambitions or just uh, civic associations, all of them, without any exclusion, which is, I think, quite symptomatic, all of them are pro-Russian. They are presenting views which are 
consistent with the positions of uh, the current government of Russian Federation and the narratives which are spread by either directly actors of Russian propaganda or their local agents, they are, I think, they're harm harmful for democracy in terms that, for example, they are propagating the uh, dominance of ethnic factors all over uh, the universal principles. So the sl Slavic Brotherhood is more important than membership in European Union and NATO, which are based on universal, uh, universal values. Uh, that liberal democracy is not uh, workable, not working concept, and much better is the strong hand uh, based on the law and order and so on. And all these narratives, of course, they are multiplying by the uh, actors of extreme, extreme rights scene. Then there are some other more concrete, more concrete factors which also are supportive for extremist politics. Uh, they are, I would say, partially more specific for Slovakia, but also, for example, anti-Western views. All these politicians are against our membership in NATO and EU. Kotleba's party initiated petition for the referendum about withdrawal of Slovakia from EU and NATO. Uh, and, of and, and here you can see uh, some positions which are Already in this, uh, I mean, several years after this party started to be parliamentary party, they are reflecting the inefficient position of the state. So I will tell more about this at the end of my, uh, of my presentation, but really so far the situation is that mostly, now probably there are some changes, but mostly all these incidents, either individual incidents or representatives of the rep of this party or individual members of the party or party as such. So when something happened that uh, uh, at least provoked uh, suspicious that it's not in compliance with law, with law, the state institutions, investigatory organs, they were not very efficient. So they rather tried to not to provoke big debate about this, not to provoke uh, uh, politicians themselves, uh, there were some cases in which, uh, for example, uh, members of local law enforcing organs were quite reluctant in, let's say, investigation of punishment of these cases. And you can imagine uh, that, let's say, in some eastern or central Slovakia, uh, Slovakia's communities in which uh, the population is mixed, Slovak and Roma. And of course, relations, inter-ethnic relations are quite tough, problematic. Uh, how people in everyday communication are violating sometimes, not all of, of, of them, but some violent persons, how they are treating, for example, Roma uh, cofellows. Yeah? And in this situation, there were many cases uh, documented by NGOs that uh, local police uh, simply didn't come to help of the people who were assaulted or otherwise uh, even maybe harmed. So, and of course, uh, trends of political ra ra radicalization, which, which is presented in these three, I think, symptoms. Uh, the mainstream politicians uh, radicalize their rhetoric. So, main, so, so politicians from mainstream party, they're using today much more radical uh, vocabulary. That radical anti-systemic forces strengthen their position in the political scene, what, what I mentioned, and you, you saw how uh, Kotleba's party uh, is strengthening its uh, electoral support, and uh, shift towards more xenophobic perception of various social groups, especially minority communities by a large group of the population. And next slide is also quite disturbing. We conducted opinion posts in which we surveyed uh, the social distance of the majority of the population toward different identity, identity defined groups, ethnic, religious groups, uh, sex, sexual orientations, and some other uh, parameters. And you see how uh, during the less than 10 years, uh, the perception of people about members of other groups really worsened. 
deteriorated. It's classical Bogardus test. Uh, would you like to have, the question was quite simple, would you like to have neighbors as from Roma family, Muslim family? You see how uh, in, some, this, in some groups the social distance really substantially uh, increased. Muslim family, understandably, uh, after this so-called refugee crisis, but also a family of migrants from less developed countries, more than two times, uh, worsened the attitude toward people of uh, so-called non-traditional sexual orientation uh, against Asian family, even against Jews, which is, I mean, it doesn't have any other explanation than only activities of fascists in the parliament, in the public discourse. Because uh, you, can, you can explain, let's say, worsening perception of Muslims or re refugees or even people with sexual orientations, uh, different sexual orientations, because there are some conservative social initiatives which are systematically working by, uh, with this topic. And of course, it's, it also can influence the people. But Jews, which is, I mean, Jewish community is almost uh, invisible and nothing happened in relations between majority population and Jews. No any occurrences, no any incidents, uh, no any even, let's say, involvement of some symbolic Jewish persons in some wrongdoings. Nothing like this happened. And we see that almost three times worsened uh, uh, perception or treatment of Jews. And I think the explanation is that fascists, they gained their platform in the parliament. They are spreading this absolutely freely uh, anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic propaganda. And the result is that uh, it became partially, maybe even mainstream. The positive, the positive thing is that Hungarian, perception of Hungarians uh, didn't change. <laughs> now, uh, some, some charts with the, it's the same opinion, Paul conducted two, two years ago. Situationally, I mean, this opinion poll was conducted several weeks before governor's elections, so regional elections, and one of the question, uh, questions is uh, how a uh, big problem uh, represent uh, the possible victory of Marianne Kotleba is governance elections. That time it was uh, really the whole state issue, not regional issue, but whole state issue. And you see that uh, 50, uh, 56% considered as a big problem. But I mean, from one side, the positive thing is that people declare that they do not like extremism. They do not like Russian hatred and intolerance. So it means so from, uh, from this point of view, of, on the level of declaration, we see that people, people reject. People reject extremism. Of course, uh, extremism um, has a negative connotation and uh, it's understandable that people are against this, but I think it's, it's important. But if we, if we look to uh, another questions, then of course we are witnessing a kind of permissive attitude to some activities of extremism. So from one side, for example, in 2017, Prosecutor General uh, filed a motion to uh, Supreme Court uh, with the suggestion to uh, dissolve uh, Kotleba's party. It didn't happen uh, two years later in April, Supreme Court denied this complaint. But at that time, 50% of the population agreed with the dissolution of extreme, extremist party. Yeah? Uh, more than one third uh, disagree, and around tenth of, of the population didn't have any opinion. And now, now uh, this this is this is an illustration of the attitude of people to different type of activities of extremism. So we see still quite high level of permission. So people are less prepared uh, uh, for uh, existence of uh, right-wing extremism as a political party. 
but uh, disseminating their views or organizing public values uh, for spreading these views. I think that in this society is, uh, is divided, but uh, this uh, share of people with permissive uh, attitude is still quite, quite high. So this is, a, as I promised, I didn't have very long presentation. Now, some, some ideas directly related with uh, what I said at the beginning. So the thesis that uh, it's not only ethnopolitics and not only uh, social de deprivation and, and the impact of social changes in society are factors of uh, growing uh, the right-wing extremism, but also this uh, illiberal degradation of democracy and irregularities uh, in uh, how country is governed by the mainstream politicians. But in this particular case in Slovakia, it's typical that we have the biggest problem when uh, populist parties are ruling the country. Now we have the mixed government, so two really populist parties and one civic party. It's for longer elaboration to explain why it happened that this government was formed, but it's, it's a fact that still uh, these mainstream uh, populists are in the power. And now the biggest problem, I think, is that uh, due to this uh, competition between particular political camps, and now we, we have more or less three camps, two equal, more or less equal concerning their strength and concerning their abilities and opportunity for them to replace each other after elections and really govern the country. And the second and the third uh, camp is still not so potent to be the ruling, but influencing uh, the discourse. So the first is govern pro-governmental camp, uh, camp, this national populist. Second, liberal democratic forces, liberal democratic parties, different ideological orientations. Uh, liberals, conservatives, civic conservatives, civic democrats, uh, mixture. But I would label them as a liberal democratic camp. And the third, smaller, so far smaller, these extremists. And then the competition between mainstream populists and uh, liberal democrats. And when mainstream populists are in the government, they consider as a more serious and therefore important danger for themselves liberal democratic camp. So they do not consider extremists as a danger for the system. So they care more about their position in the, in the power. They are, during the governance, they are trying to weaken as uh, strong as possible their electoral political competitors, the liberal democrats. They are inventing different measures. They are, uh, they are uh, introducing uh, amendments to law. They are distorting the uh, procedures of uh, how parliament works. For example, today, uh, which is absolutely scandalous thing that in the parliament, the extraordinary session of the parliament uh, wasn't open because of the obstruction of the ruling coalition MPs, which is, I think it's not in compliance with the standing order of the parliament, but it's, it's normal uh, in our country that uh, I mean, these two competing camps uh, are trying to weaken each other, but the mainstream populists, they are much more aggressive, and I have to say that the more e efficient in weakening the liberal democrats, because it's a part of their habit. When liberal democrats are governing, they are respecting uh, procedural consensus uh, norms. They are justifying their position by values, but. Uh, the opposite camp is not doing this. And the result, result is that all these uh, illiberal regressions, uh, again, many uh, examples, they are serving to harm or to weaken liberal democrats, but they are absolutely harmless for the extremists. Only one step was done, or at least it was, it was an effort to dissolve the fascist party, uh, by prosecutor general, but uh, several months ago, weeks, uh, Supreme Court simply denied. So now the result is that uh, this liberal democratic camp is more fragmented, 
maybe less potent, uh, but extremists are rising, boosting their support, and uh, enjoying uh, higher support of uh, electorate than it was three years ago when they penetrated uh, the parliament. So now I, I see that Ivan is informally giving me signals that probably I should now finish my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Grigori. So much food for thought, and as you said in your introduction, relevant to so many other countries uh, in all over Europe, uh, in, in many, many member states, uh, as to the political dynamics between uh, mainstream, the weakening mainstream, rising far right. I will uh, hold back uh, on my questions, and I have several because I want to open it immediately uh, to the floor. We have uh, about 20 minutes for, for discussion, so uh, I see Holly. Uh, First, and do introduce yourselves because I think Grigori doesn't know most of you. Uh, I'll take three questions, Holly, Peter, and uh, someone else, and Alida. Thanks so much. Uh, this was really interesting. I'm Holly Case. I'm a historian at Brown University. Um, I have a couple of questions. One is on your slides about the energies, um, the, your slide about the different energies that were driving this movement. Yeah. I was thinking that pretty much all of the categories except the last two um, didn't really uh, answer the question of why now. And uh, the last two maybe um, get to that. I can't remember exactly <laughs> what they are. Yes. Yeah, effective communication of extremists and trends of political radicalization. So uh, the effective communication matter, I'm wondering if uh, you could speak to something that they yes. have changed in their methods. And it, it makes me wonder, because I'm thinking back to the 1990s, and I'm wondering if the category of extremism existed then, if people would recognize that word as a meaningful word in the 1990s, or whether it became somehow meaningful at the same time that uh, right-wing parties stopped stopped presenting themselves as extremists, you know, the, started uh, presenting themselves as mainstream parties, more or less, or as, poten as having the potential to be mainstream parties. So I'm wondering, you know, first of all, where does this category of extremism come from? And what, is, what do people associate it with in their minds? Because when I was looking at these charts that you had of people speaking about extremism, a lot of the media talks about Muslim or Islamic extremism, for example. And so that word could set off all kinds of things that have nothing to do with uh, the far right, for example. And so when does this word extremism come into the political discourse? Mm -hmm. And if you were to talk about the 1990s and you were to ask the same questions, like what do you think uh, the charts would look like for the 1990s? Um, also, um, in the course of your talk, uh, you referred to a couple of instances where there were efforts uh, on the part of this or that uh, party in government to dissolve the f extreme, the far right parties. So, um, and the Supreme Court basically says no. In that respect, it seems as though part of what you're saying is subtextually is that su the Supreme Court is kind of the problem. And so the question is, like, where, like, is it that um, people are making bad decisions or that they're being sent the wrong signals by mm -hmm. institutions that are themselves making bad decisions? Or what would be, where is the locus where some of this could change in your mind? And where is the locus where the mistakes are being made? Mm -hmm. Like, okay. uh, and um, finally, I, I find the statistic about the Hungarians very interesting. First of all, that it starts out low. Second of all, that it stays low. Um, and uh, it, I'm fascinated by the fact that not that long ago, in a lot of places, Hungary included, the near abroad was the primary locus of political agitation and thinking about what nationalism is and what it means, and it's not anymore. Like, if you were to try to explain, like, how did that stop being the case, that ethno-nationalism of the near abroad sort or of the in domestic minority sort stopped being re relevant for politics, like, how did that happen and who did it? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's a lot of questions in one question. Yeah, yeah. So Go ahead. <laughs> well, first, uh, why just now and uh, 
this effective communication of extremists. I think it was the first question. Yeah, effective communication. Well, uh, they are doing really field, field work. In elections in 2016, but also it's continuing in other elections, they are literally going to the all villages and communities in some regions in which they know that they have potential supporters. In Eastern Slovakia, in some, some districts of Central Slovakia. So, and, and many people are telling that at least f now first time we saw the real politicians in our village that either Kotleba or some of his close uh, colleagues came and, and, meet and met with people. Met with people, then what they are, do they are doing, they started to do this and it showed as a very efficient way also in some, again, in some environments that after, let's say, natural catastrophe or some problematic situations, they are coming to help. They're coming to, I don't know, to uh, store the waste, for example, in some, in some villages, or they are doing social, social uh, work. And I think that the problem is also with this, it's for longer uh, discussion, I don't want to really to go in the deep into detail, but partially it's related, again, it's different, different question, that people do not consider state as efficient, even if state is really working, providing, uh, we can criticize, but provi providing normal social conditions, paying pensions, uh, other social allowances providing uh, different type of services and people take it and, as something absolutely normal, something usual, but when extremists are, are coming to the villages and they're doing something very minor, that people are absolutely amazed that some, somebody cares about us. What state did before, they somehow overlook or they d simply consider this as, a, as a normal. Then extremism, uh, the term extremism started to be used in what I remember in Slovakia in the mid 90s. And uh, it's a term for labeling the political forces which are going beyond the system. So at least in Slovakia, but I think that in Hungary probably it's the same. So it's a synonym of uh, anti-system forces. So uh, no democracy, uh, no systemic uh, elements of the social order, by the way, including the foreign policy, including membership in European Union, and, uh, uh, but, but mostly it's, uh, the connotation is that extremis, extremism is, poli is political, ideological, or opinion stream, which is not in broader sense, compatible with democracy, with the rule of law, with the liberal democratic norms. And from this point of view, of course, uh, Kotleba's party is an uh, extremist party, but for example, Slovak National Party, which is radical, it's a, it's a radical nationalist party, but they are, they, are, they are not removing the system. They are not preparing for, they are not proposing any alternatives. They are by, uh, their government, they worsen, of course, the democracy, but they are not removing. And one very important remark, the first Kotleba's party was dissolved. In 2006, Kotle the first Kotleba party, name was different, but guy was the same. And many people who are now members of this party, uh, they established the party Slovenska Pospolitos, the Slovak community of Slovak togetherness. And at that time, prosecutor general also filed uh, this motion uh, in Supreme Court quite quickly dissolved this party. Now, I think that it was a failure of both actors of this, but I will elaborate more politically, but uh, f formally it was a really badly elaborated complaint of Prosecutor General and very formalistic approach of Supreme Court because the two years they we were considering 21 pages document. They studied 21 pages document. So only those facts which were collected by prosecutor general. No any other evidences. I mean, a lot of evidences, every, every day newspapers. Bloggers who are following uh, 
extremists on the local and regional levels. They are publishing every day, I mean, occurrences related to activities of this party. But Supreme Court, uh, Supreme Court uh, didn't make a decision that uh, that Kotaibas party is a democratic party. Yeah, they simply rejected the complaint that uh, according to these five members Senate, uh, the facts which were collected didn't create, uh, create a background for, for dissolution of the party. So answering to your question, in this particular case, it was, I think, the failure of the, not of the government, of course, but the state institutions as such. But uh, just to mention one example from two days uh, uh, before communicado of uh, Mr. Fizzo. Uh, last week, one of the members of this party was sentenced in criminal procedure. He was sentenced for financial fine, but it was a criminal. So he was sentenced uh, in the criminal uh, criminal process uh, for spreading hate about Roma. He was uh, sentenced two times by the lawyer uh, courts and then Supreme Court confirmed this. So immediately, automatically, he lost his mandate. He, he was a uh, MP. And Mr. Fizzo, chairman of Social Democratic Party, recorded a video in which he de facto criticized the uh, Supreme Court and the justification for his position was that everybody in Slovakia thinks how Mazurek presented the, his views about Roma. So it means that now Supreme Court simply punished all the population, something like this. So the guy who was absolutely in accordance with all provisions of criminal law was sentenced, was accused and sentenced for, for, crime, for crimes. According to Fizzo, it was a bad decision. Yeah. Uh, I can imagine, I, I, it's just my speculation, but if the uh, if Supreme Court would uh, dissolve Kotleba's party, then Fizzo probably will be the first who would criticize this. But, but uh, just one minute. But the most <laughs> interesting thing is that the guy who, uh, who is now in prison for his uh, suspicious in ordering the murder of Jan Kuciak and his fiancé, Marian Kochner. And uh, he was known by his very close con contacts with the highest political echelon in the country. And police uh, decoded his communication uh, through Srima with, uh, with his lover and co-fellow in crimes. And in which, in this communication, he was telling her that uh, after the murder, uh, when it wasn't clear whether the government will survive or not, that his idea was uh, to not to replace one of the parties which at that time probably would uh, uh, leave the coalition. It didn't happen, but they were thinking about this, this uh, Slovak-Hungarian civic party, that Kotleba, Kotleba par Kotleba's party would support them because, and now the most interesting thing, because I managed on Supreme Court that they didn't, uh, uh, didn't dissolve them. And he, and he had really, and he, so far he had probably now, he has contacts to ministers, judges, prosecutors, uh, high police office, offices. So if he was influences judges in district court, why, she, why he couldn't do this in Supreme Court? So I don't want to say that Supreme Court uh, released the ruling because uh, Judges were bribed by Koshner, but he was communicating about this as a fait accompli. Peter. I would have a Peter Krakow, uh, Political Capital Institute, uh, Budapest. Thanks, Grigory, for the very yeah, in-depth uh, introduction to, to, the <laughs> to the dark side of Slovak politics. I, I would yeah, I would have one uh, follow-up question on the bright side as well, why uh, the Hungarians yeah, are sorry, so, I, so popular. Yeah. And the second I one would be a very, um, very specific uh, question. Do you think that this polarization that you highlighted, the, the uh, 
rise of the extreme forces and, and their ideology, and at the same time, rise of the progressive forces, this is, is it something that will, do you expect to happen at the uh, parliamentary elections as well? Or, it, or, or so this is a trend, or, or you think it's like a short-term phenomenon, and, and there could be, let's say, more positive development um, as, as the uh, aftermath of this whole uh, Jan Kuciak murder? Yeah. Maybe I, I will start uh, with the final, your final question. Yeah, I, I expect that it will be the trends uh, till the next elections. Uh, it's not only uh, strengthening the progressive camp, it's one party, uh, I mean this coalition, Progressive Slovakia and together Spolu uh, party, it's only part of them, uh, they are progressives. The second, uh, the second part of this coalition, they are members of European People Party, so not progressive party, but they are, they are democratic. Yeah, I think that uh, uh, the process of uh, maybe overcoming the fragmentation of democratic camp will continue. I personally expect that uh, maybe at least one pre-electoral pre coalition will be formed from this progressive together coalition and uh, new party of Mr. Kiska, the former president, now in public opinion poll yesterday, I think that he gained almost 9%, which is a good result. And of course, it will help the democratic forces to, to win in elections. The question is whether it will be enough for creation of the pro-democratic government of, or not. And in this situation, Kotleba is, I mean, the presence of Kotleba is complicating creation of the de democratic govern government with the majority. Yeah, because he is, I mean, with, uh, with Kotleba, whom, who is uh, rejected by all actors, we will see what Mr. Fizzo, how Mr. Fizzo will behave after the next elections. But I cannot imagine that even with him as a, as a leader, the Smer party would be able to either form direct coalition with fascist party or I mean, uh, the government, minority government will be supported by the fascist party. It will be the catastrophe for the reputation of this party. But I think that Mr. Fizzo in, in last months probably doesn't care very much about reputation. But then to this Slovak Hungarian agenda. Sorry, I forgot to answer your question. I think that uh, paradoxically, Viktor Orban and uh, Robert Fizzo, they, uh, because of their pragmatic purposes, they contributed to uh, keeping the relations between two states and therefore two nations in a relatively calm state. So uh, I don't know whether they, uh, co uh, they uh, concluded the formal agreement, but it's true that even Slovak National Party, which, is, which was a party of one topic, and this topic was Hungary. Hungarians, Hungary, everything about Hungary and Hungarians, and this party is now silent. Uh, probably they realize that uh, there are other issues in which they can collect votes than only uh, ethnic Hungarians. But another aspect, I don't, I don't want to provoke Peter Yu, and I know that what Viktor Orban is now doing, uh, it's a big failure, I think, of, of Hungarian transformation to democracy. But one positive impact, very different that, uh, than what happened uh, in our country, that in our country, the government of Smer, which uh, declared his anti-fascism and, and resistance to hatred, extremism, and so on, de facto led to strengthening of extremists. Now they are in parliament, is in a more comfortable situation. Now they are in stronger position. They have their representation in uh, European parliament. They are enjoying quite big uh, space in public discourse. I mean, they are they penetrated the mainstream politics. So they're an inseparable, inseparable part of the of political spectrum. In Hungary, Viktor Orban was and still is fighting ab again against liberal Democrats, but at the same time, somehow he succeeded to weaken Jobbik. Because he incorporated the ideology in, in Fidesz's politics. Well, yes, yes, but, but nevertheless, I mean, uh, there are differences between Fidesz. I don't want to, I mean, uh, <laughs> to, positive, to, to mention this as a positive example. But the fact is that today in Slovakia, right-wing extremists, extremists are much stronger than Jobbik in Hungary. And you remember, I mean, 10 years ago, what was the situation with Jobbik? I mean, and, and Viktor Orban somehow succeeded to 
to weaken them. Yeah. In Slovakia, we are witnessing completely opposite development. Yeah. One final question from, okay. Uh, okay, Clemena, one final, keep it short, please, uh, because yes. we're over time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I was uh, looking at the explanations that you had of why this is the case, that you have uh, this rising extreme right, and you have these internal yes. factors, and uh, for me, they're very easy to recognize because they're quite similar to the mm -hmm. ones in Bulgaria, as you know, I'm Bulgarian. Now, I was looking at the uh, external ones. Yes. You know, I, I find it quite ironic, of course, that people are not afraid of Hungarians, and there are many Hungarians in Slovakia, they're afraid of refugees, and there are no refugees. And the refugees don't even want to go to Slovakia, with all due respect, they don't want to go to Bulgaria either. But I was also looking at the other factor there, uh, and you just mentioned it and didn't say that much about it, about Russia's influence. Because if Russia's influence mainly comes in terms of narratives about liberal democracy doesn't work, I mean, surely this is something that resonates with quite a lot of people, and you don't need Russia to tell you that. You know, to me it sounds a little bit like in the American elections where so much was done by the Democrats to say, to put the blame on Russia and everybody felt, well, you don't re need Russia to meddle in the elections, you're sort of explaining your own fa uh, failures by, you know, looking for external factors. I just wonder to well, what an okay. extent this is an important factor and in what way? Okay, yeah, well, uh, uh, it's uh, after the Russian-Ukrainian war, it's a wave, literally, it's a wave of uh, different narratives coming either directly from Russia or through different channels, but I think that originated also, only, uh, also in Russia, which are relevant for socio-cultural environment uh, in Slovakia. Similarly as Bulgaria, Slovakia is a Slavic country. So it means that Speaking about uh, liberal democracy in this country, it's a bit different than, let's say, speaking about liberal democracy in the United States, in which also there are some considerations how Russian, Russians uh, interfered in electoral campaign. But in, in Slovakia, it's different. First, uh, Slovakia was a part of uh, the Soviet bloc. There are local actors which are from different reasons they have active part of this influence yeah this so-called sharp power they are voluntarily doing this then uh, russia is really very assert assertive today uh, russia uh, and i think that similar situation was in other countries but russia during the Yeltsin's uh, uh, government and several years of, uh, of Putin's government uh, wasn't very in favor of our uh, membership in the European Union, especially in NATO, but that time Russia simply wasn't enough strong. Russia didn't conduct these efforts. But today, uh, speaking about our participation, let's say, in the European Union, because the main idea of uh, of uh, Russia's uh, soft power is to disconnect us from the West. And of course, it's a strategic, strategic uh, goal of extremists. All of them are against our membership in the European Union and NATO. So today, of course, uh, Russian narratives are more appealing than it was, let's say, before Ru uh, Russian-Ukrainian war, but also some other events in, in the European Union look, look to Brexit, for example. I think that uh, uh, is still for some part of Russian establishment very encouraging factor. So if it happened to Great Britain, why it couldn't happen, let's say, to small Slovakia, which is a country with a traditional uh, affinity to cultural influence of Russia and so on. I don't want to blame, I mean, uh, people or Russia as a country. It's a, it's a very interesting country, talented people, but uh, the Russian state, I mean, uh, the strategy of Russian state toward uh, this part of Europe was always to disconnect from uh, the West, and especially today in this confrontation related to Russian-Ukrainian conflict to strengthen any actor which is supportive for Russia. And as I said, all these extreme right uh, politicians, uh, different organizations, not only Kotleba's party, but 
We have even some paramilitary groups in the country, and we conducted with uh, Peter, Skreko, Peter Krekos Institute the special survey about this. I mean, they have Russian connections. Grigori, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, we shall seamlessly uh, move to uh, Nicolò Milanese's uh, presentation. Uh, Nicolò comes to us uh, from Paris. Uh, he is a philosopher and, and an author and a poet. And he is the director of European Alternatives. He's a, a theoretician and an activist and has been running European Alternatives for four Twelve. or five? Twelve years. Mm. My goodness, you look so young, Nicole. <laughs> Mine started young. <laughs> Where does Europe end is the theme of uh, Nicolò's uh, research project. He uh, published uh, this book, uh, Citizens of Nowhere, with his colleague Lorenzo Marsili, How Europe Can Be Saved From Itself, and it has been recently translated into German, and we had a presentation uh, with Nicolò here in May uh, at the Institute. And uh, as a Europe's Futures Fellow, he will be looking uh, at uh, this uh, topic that I uh, mentioned, where does Europe end? Political significations of Europe's uncertain geographies. Nicolò. Thanks very much, Ivan. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be back in this room standing up because last time I was here, I hurt, I hurt myself on my way here. I hurt my ankle and I was sitting there with my, my foot stretched out. So this time I'm going to take full advantage of the fact that I'm, I'm mobile. Um, as Ivan said, the, the research project is about this question. Where does Europe end? Uh, the political significations of Europe's uncertain geographies. I've just started thinking about it since a week, uh, so I'm still in some uh, perplexity, but um, maybe it's clear to me uh, at least where the interest is coming from. There's, let's say, a theoretical interest and then an activist interest, so my two, two of my personas are involved. The theoretical uh, interest is um, perhaps in an overarching topic of how to grasp, how to characterize our political collectivities. Um, and I use that word to try to get away from talking about our political identities, which sounds like it's an individual identity, um, to talk about our, the collectives we are part of. And my sense that um, the resources of theorizing around nationalism and nations, all the resources that are made available by talking about the globe or the whole world, and neither, neither of them sufficient, um, either individually or together, to grasp onto our political collectivities, that a missing category, um, which has been extremely important in world history and European history in particular, is that of empire. And we have great difficulties to, to sort of imaginatively grasp onto what does it mean to be part of empire, because I think perhaps they're, they're black spots in our historical memory still. Um, and in that um, yeah, state of, of, of theoretical uh, searching, the idea of Europe um, is an interesting one because it is an intermediary term. It's somehow neither reducible to uh, a national concept. It's also not global. Um, throughout its history, it's been its history as, a, as an idea uh, and as an idea of, of poets and ancient Greek philosophers uh, before it, long before it became the idea of, of institutions. Um, it's always been something that people are searching for or that seems to be some distance away. Europa, the goddess, is someone we're looking for. Um, we don't know where she is. Um, or Europe is the other shore or something like this. There's this... Um, uncertainty built into the term, which people that we've all read, uh, Denis de Rougemont, Sigmund Bauman, Jacques Derrida, have, have grasped onto as something that's an interesting potential with Europe. It's, it's got a, this potential of adventure or project in it. Um, we all know that that potential is also a very dangerous one. That links up again with the idea of empire. So this is somehow the theoretical background of the uh, research project. The activist background, because uh, when I'm not 
sitting down thinking about what does Europe mean. I'm going around the territory we call Europe, um, talking with people about it and campaigning for various things. And one of the very common things that people tend to say, uh, and everybody's heard this, is Europe feels very far away. or well, the European institutions are very far away. Um, and there is, in saying that, a spatial metaphor of some kind. Um, uh, what is that spatial metaphor about? Um, it would be perhaps understandable if you're in Marseille to say Paris feels very far away or the French Parliament feels very far away, but saying that France feels very far away, <laughs> it would have to be some specific context in which you were trying to say that. You could, maybe you could say the, la République est, est, est loin, the, the Republic is far away. Maybe if you were trying to make a point about the absence of uh, the action of the Republic in your, in, your, in your area, in a place like Marseille. But anyhow, the, the, this spatial um, reference seems, seems curious and worth, worth thinking about. The way that the European Union and the European Union institutions and, and, and political actors and others um, tend to try to address that, because uh, they're pretty aware of all these people saying, you seem a very long way away is um, to make themselves present by uh, putting flags on projects that they've sponsored um, or by trying to be very concrete uh, as, they, as they think about it in, in terms of showing the benefits of European Union membership. Um, you, know, that you, can, you can talk about the quality of your food. You can talk about, you, know, you can be sure of the, the, the nature of the car that you buy in one country, you drive to another country. It's like practical benefits. Um, and I'm not sure, I mean, as, as useful as all of those things might be to make Europe less abstract, more concrete, I don't know whether it does anything to address the feeling of its distance. Um, now, there are probably other reasons that it feels it's very untransparent. Um, there's not talking heads in the same way as a, as a French president to represent Europe. Those factors are surely there as well. But I want to suggest that part of the reason for reaching for this spatial metaphor of it feels far away has got something to do with what great theorist that he was, Jose Manuel Barroso, uh, called the uh, unidentified political objecthood of the European Union. It's something that is very unfamiliar as a political object. We don't quite know how to classify it, think about it, and um, that might be part of the reason why it feels far away. And perhaps an important part of that is that the European Union doesn't know how to think about its own territory. And there might be um, a reason for that, uh, which is perhaps also a deep political reason about the identity of political collectivities in general, is that Europe has, until now, not had to think very hard about its external relationships, uh, or how to justify itself to external actors. Um, and so that's, that's, that's those two um, things are, are how I've been led into the topic. And I guess the active uh, importance of it is that I would want to feel that if I'm touring around Europe, trying to talk to people about what the European Union means and what we ought to do with it and so on, I think that I, I, I'm lacking a fully convincing way of articulating actually what it is, uh, the European Union. Um, another way of putting this would be that I, I've written a book that even kindly held up Citizens of Nowhere, uh, the, the, which obviously is playing off of Theresa May's phrase. The, the obvious thing perhaps to do after a book called Citizens of Nowhere is to think about quite what the place um, that nowhere is standing in for is. We're not citizens of nowhere. Um, but we're perhaps also not citizens of somewhere in the rather traditional sense that some writers talk about citizens of somewhere. Um, so this is, this is the topic. There could still be some doubts about whether the European Union has a territory. Um, some people have, have thought about it as a post-territorial actor um, as if somehow the European Union could dispense with thinking about its territory at all. Um, and perhaps even th th seeing that as a good thing, it's a post-territorial actor which is therefore better adapted to our post-territorial world 
um, which is full of flows and, and, and networks and these kinds of um, things. And so it doesn't necessarily need to have um, a concept of territory. I tend to think that if it doesn't need a concept of territory, that might be because other, there's the presupposition that other actors are, are doing the work of having a concept of territory. And that, obviously enough, is the member states. The presupposition is that the European Union doesn't need a concept of territory because the territory is already defined by the nation states. The nation states concern themselves with their territory. Um, and this introduces the, the difficulty of the thinking about European Union territory uh, that clearly, if it's got a relationship with its territory, its relationship is different to its territory uh, than the nation state relationship, if only because there's these entities called nation states, which are the member states of the European Union, somewhere in the mix. And it's easy then to think about a kind of hierarchy of levels, um, levels of governance or this kind of thing. Um, but I would, I would, so I mean, if we take a very simple-minded view of what, what a territory is, um, simple-minded, by that I don't mean to characterize David Miller, who's, who's, whose definition I'm going to use. David Miller says that if we're going to talk about territory in a political sense, it involves three things. It, use, it involves a land, uh, it involves some people who are resident on that land, and it involves um, some governmental institutions which govern that land. And the question of territory is what is the relationship between those three things? Now, if that's what a territory is, then the European Union, I would suggest, has quite clearly a territory. Um, and even if there's these member states which are somehow involved, I think it's now difficult to maintain that the European Union has no direct impact at all or no relationship of governance at all with the people who are living on that territory. Um, and it's certainly difficult to maintain that the European Union has no role at all in, for example, managing the borders of that territory um, today. So it would seem like there, there, is, there is a case for having a, a theory of territory. But I think that David Miller's um, definition, which, which I've summarized, misses out two key components of, of, of territory, at least if you want to get to the kind of questions that I started off with, the practical one and the theoretical one. Um, that is that in addition to having a piece of land, some people living on the land and uh, some governmental institutions, one also needs to think about the relationship of that specific piece of land um, and the specific people living on it with other pieces of land, uh, with other people eventually living on them and other governmental institutions. So it's a question of the individuation of territory. Um, and one also needs to think about the ways that uh, the, the territory is represented, conceived, felt, imagined by the people living on the land. They would most likely have an attachment to a particular territory. That's one way of saying that territory is not a kind of replaceable, substitutable good whereby you could just move people from one territory to another territory. As long as they've got a territory, they're happy. No, people have got attachments to a particular um, territory, which seems to be linked with their conception of space and feeling of homeless and so on. So this is getting to the questions about Europe feels very far away. It's to do with the phenomenology of the space um, and how are we going to... How are we going to understand that? Um, so that's sort of an in introduction to uh, a theory of territory of um, the European Union. And um, I think that the, um, the um, element that is, that is, that is uh, particularly tricky about it is this relationship with the um, member states. And it goes to the question of empire that I, that I started with. Because it's, it would be easy to think, and that's how um, the European Union 
announces or narrates itself that there are the member states existing with their territories in advance of the European Union arriving. Um, so that you, you'd have your, your nice member states <laughs> and you put them all together and then you've got the European Union. You could kind of build it like a jigsaw puzzle. And there's the territory. Um, but the history wasn't like that. Um, history wasn't like that and that perhaps tells us something about the um, about the normative orientation I, for, for want of a better word of the European territory. Firstly when it was built in, in the first days when it was built as you all know uh, many of the member states had empires um, and so uh, there was decision made about where the borders of what would become the European Union would be. A and, and part of the motivation for the whole project was about how to maintain those member states' colonies. And so the border was implicit, but it's a border that is not um, uh, so much the where Europe ends as a hierarchical border um, introducing membership and otherness, but otherness which is not totally detached, but otherness which is a colonial relationship. Um, and so there's, a, there's a, a decision being taken about how to conceive and set up a European space post Second World War with a view to guarding um, various European empires. Secondly, um, some of the countries which will become European Union members didn't have their current uh, borders at the time when the European Union was originally set up. And, um, and so the creation of various member states with their current borders can't be dissociated from the existence of the European Union. Another part of that story is that when the European Union was set up, its eastern border was um, clear, at least in the sense that there was an iron curtain. Um, and so uh, there you have the border as something which is uh, imposed and where there is the idea to go beyond it. Um, the border is the frontier, if you like, of a European space, which is to be ex extended. Um, and this second conception of uh, the border is the one that has continued um, and been prevalent in Europe's self-conception. Because if it's had an external policy at all, uh, and a way of thinking about its external policy, it's been, in, at least in its immediate neighbourhood, one of uh, extension and accession. Um, that way of conceiving of the border uh, now is reaching various kinds of limits. Um, some limits that have been there for a while about people questioning whether certain countries really should be included in the European Union. So there's, there's been, almost for as long as the European Union has been around, there's been a question about the status of Turkey. Um, now, obviously, as well, because uh, the news these days is not so much about the European Union extending its borders, but rather people wanting to pull out um, and finding out how difficult that is. And so um, one's forced to try to think about the European um, borders, not in terms of a frontier, um, frontier advancing, but in that some other kind of way. Um, now, it turns out that this idea of the European Union having a territory um, is something that European politicians have tried to skirt around for most of Europe's history, talking rather about space, a European space uh, of free movement, for example. Um, but with the attempt to create a European constitution, um, which then failed and then eventually came about with the Lisbon Treaty, there is a territorial policy of the European Union. 
um, and an objective of having territorial cohesion, for example. Um, I think it's um, significant that territorial cohesion is a matter of the cohesion of the internal territory of the European Union and spatial planning, um, urban planning, those kinds of questions. It's quite detached from the other questions about uh, the borders of the European Union and its relationship with external territories. Um, and I think that there's, there's all kinds of contingent reasons for that. Um, but I think that there's also a, a reason in the way that the European Union wants to think about itself as a community of law, um, as a um, normative community of values, that um, also intellectually we have some difficulty modern political philosophy has some difficulty thinking about where the borders should be and what justifies borders. Um, and so in our, in our uh, modern conception of ourselves, um, our, our individual freedom is quite disarticulated from um, our collective belonging and the necessary implication that that collective belonging is distinct from other collective belongings. Um, and so the European Union, to my mind, in its, its, in its trouble with territory, um, is kind of an extreme example of um, the, um, some of the unthought questions in uh, modern political philosophy. Now, I gesture towards the fact that these um, these issues of territory are, are now becoming uh, obligatory to think about for the European Union. There's at least three um, reasons for that. Um, and perhaps it's useful to say some words about each of them to be a little bit more concrete and then you might have some inspiration for some concrete questions which are a bit easier than the abstract uh, gestures that I made before. Those three um, reasons are the question of territorial cohesion um, and how the different elements of European governance, if you want to talk like that, should interact at different levels um, to implement European Union policies. So that's a deeply discussed, actually, um, topic inside inside urban studies and, and geography um, around the fact that it's now difficult to think about a multi-scalar form of governance at least in for example big cities um, because it's very difficult to identify the scale of different actors and there's a related discussion about what does European Union subsidiarity mean if you can no longer clearly identify who's the local actor who's a national actor who's a European actor, when you're trying to solve specific problems on the ground, as it were. Um, so that's one, uh, one reason that the question of territory has come back, um, perhaps urgently now, because the territorial cohesion of the European Union has been so threatened or felt like it's in a sense of crisis in the context of the Euro crisis. Uh, so whereas before there could have been some imaginary that there was convergence happening somehow magically, um, now there's strong divergence. And so the question of cohesion, how are we going to do it, is, um, is much more present. The second uh, reason, and perhaps the overwhelming one for the majority of the population, is the migration question and, um, and how migration to the European Union is managed quite patently uh, poses questions about the borders of the European Union, how they're conceived, um, and indeed where they are, because one of the dominant responses of uh, the European Union as a whole has been to, as it said, deterritorialize the borders. And what tends to be meant by that is trying to move the border away from the land border uh, and to put it bluntly, when it comes to migrants, put the problem somewhere else, whether it be in Turkey 
or in camps in Libya or elsewhere. Um, and part of the point of doing that, surely, has got to do with the, what I earlier on called, the phenomenology of the European territory, that by moving the problem elsewhere, one is attempting to make it invisible, or at least invisible or absent for the European population living on the European territory, because you've moved it to Turkey or to Libya. Um, no one pretends, well, I mean, as some people do pretend that it solves a real problem around people smuggling or so on, but it's quite plainly not about that. It's about moving it out of a mental space of the Europeans and putting it somewhere else. Um, so that's a way of saying that the European politicians do have a conception of, a working conception of territory that they exploit. <laughs> so that's, that was the second reason why this question of territory is, is urgent. Um, and the third reason, which is the most topical, um, is around uh, secession. Um, so think of Catalonia uh, or Scotland um, and how the European Union should deal with with that, or uh, wanting to leave the European Union, um, as, as the UK is doing. And I think that the UK example, um, and specifically the questions around the Irish border, but not only the questions about the Irish border, um, show that the European Union has a kind of, enacts a kind of paradigm shift in what territory means. Uh, in comparison with the member states. And it shows that quite specifically because our Article 50, as now everybody's familiar with, allows the possibility of a member state to leave. And, um, and the argument, the, the, the core of the argument about the Irish border, but also uh, more generally the sort of mismatch between the way the European Union and its negotiators think about things and the way the UK negotiators want to think about things is that um, there is, uh, in talking about the member state being able to leave, the presupposition would, would be read from the UK perspective that the UK, um, in its integrity, in particular in its territorial integrity, as understood independently from the European Union and its context, should be able to leave. And as you know from the Irish border case, that's almost impossible to achieve. If by territorial integrity, you mean that there should be no, um, there should be no uh, jurisdictional overlaps or forms of um, deep political cooperation, um, running over that territory. It's difficult to achieve with the Irish border because precisely the way in which the conflict was, uh, was um, displaced, calmed down sufficiently that there be an agreement between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland um, um, was premised on everybody taking part in um, at least most of these overlapping rings of forms of cooperation. And if you try and pull one part out of that, you create uh, what's called the hard border, by which they mean um, physical infrastructure at the border in Northern Ireland. Now, although it hasn't been really applied to the, to the UK case because there's not enough trust in the UK's intentions in leaving the European Union and also, um, and also the size of the UK's economy, notably, make it difficult to achieve. The EU has got um, tools of um, territorial differentiation at its disposal. So if you look at the case of Cyprus, for example, around about 40% of the territory of Cyprus uh, is not under the acquis communautaire because of the unresolved conflict in Cyprus. And 
the green line which separates northern Cyprus from from the Republic of Cyprus. Um, and so it's possible for the EU to think about uh, what, a, what, what laws and, and uh, apply to a country without having to take into account the whole country. That's the point of the example. Um, so it shows that the EU is capable of dealing with um, a conception of territory which is quite clearly distinct from um, that of a, of a nation state. Now, the Cyprus case is different because of the size of Cyprus and also because quite clearly the intention is, the political motivation for that arrangement is that eventually um, the Aki will apply to the whole island of Cyprus. Um, and the UK case is going quite notably in the opposite direction, or it seems to. Uh, but nonetheless, it's worth thinking about, and it's certainly worth thinking about these coming years when this will continue to be discussed, uh, whether there could be solutions of territorial differentiation with the UK, with, for example, Scotland staying in various forms of European cooperation, um, and England not, and how that might be set up in a way that, for example, doesn't create a hard border between Scotland and England. And so um, those uh, three examples of how this territorial question is coming back and is now posed, migration, territorial integrity understood as social and territorial cohesion inside the European Union, and um, Brexit, which is, a si which is, if you like, the, is, is, is the moment that the EU is forced to, cons to uh, clarify what its relationship with its ex external uh, borders is, um, because there is nothing, because the, because the UK is fully integrated, um, by saying what it means to leave, you're setting up quite clearly um, what it means to be outside, in no other sense than the decision of what it means to be outside, because everything else is already thoroughly integrated, you see what I mean? So. The UK is the test case of what is the relationship between the inside and the outside of the European Union. So those three uh, examples are some of the concrete ways I'm going to think about the problem over the coming year. Um, if you've got any tips, now is the moment, <laughs> or, or questions or total clarity, um, I would be really grateful. Thanks very much. Nicola, thank you very much for sharing your uh, framework and initial thoughts. And obviously, the examples uh, are, are very patent. Uh, just, just some very uh, brief thoughts. I mean, given that uh, where I come from, the former Yugoslavia uh, and the Balkans, and given that uh, Serbia is a candidate country uh, that is uh, now negotiating membership and having been for a brief moment, the foreign policy advisor to the prime minister, the European Union has hammered into us the sentence, we will never take in a new Cyprus. So you'd better solve your territorial problems before you even think of becoming uh, a member. So mm -hmm. another little addition to that. And then just a, a kind of a, a private observation. This Summer, I went back to the former country, which obviously was seamless and had no borders uh, since I was born until 1991. And uh, traveling around the former country, I had to pass new borders, four of them. Uh, and, uh, you know, entre nous, it seemed ridiculous. Uh, having been without borders, now you have borders, and that uh, throws back light onto the Irish border, which clearly is, is uh, a burning question. And uh, it's interesting that the European Union, which has difficulty in finding a, a one voice on so many issues, on this particular issue, is really adamant and unified in saying that uh, it will be relentless in seeking uh, and maintaining a, a backstop. OK, I saw Milos wanted to ask a question. So go ahead. Thank you. I'm Milos Schwitz. I'm a permanent fellow here. I would like to make some remarks from probably history, law, and politics. 
Uh, of course, I share fully also your comments. Borders are back um, on a daily scale now, not only in our debates, but also in practical politics. But if you see it from a larger scale, you see that, again, this is also, so to say, maybe a moment in time. Um, you stressed very much on the dichotomy of inside and outside and physical borders are a part of this. And if, if we look back at state formation, uh, so this is 1,000 years ago, the, the, probably the first international treaties were border treaties mm -hmm. in Mesopotamia. Um, but I somehow feel that if we look at the last 1,000 years, there has been, so to say, a rise uh, of talking and conceptualizing borders. So sovereignty was about superioritas territorialis, no shared jurisdiction, as you also said. So this is, so to say, the icon of political acting. No shared sovereignty, no shared jurisdiction, uh, no overlaps. But at the same time, if we, if we consider uh, the big questions of politics today, I mean, Fridays for Future, some of those challenges uh, give us the impression that borders and uh, territory may be some, be some issue, not of the present, but you know, past 20th century futures uh, ch challenges. And I'm wondering if we not should engage in conceptualizing a world beyond uh, territorial sovereignty borders, but defining the political community by challenges, tools, transnational options, and so on. I mean, I have no ideas how to, to, to solve that issue, and it's really a big problem. But some of my colleagues from legal theory or so, they are trying to go into that direction, thinking about you know, uh, energy, waste disposal, the oceans and so on. So th this is just very vague, but uh, to give you some, some thoughts. Many thanks. Thanks. Can, can I jump on yeah, that sure. immediately? Just because, I mean, I spend my whole life talking about transnational activism and going beyond borders. But um, I, I, think it's a I think it's a mistake, and that's why I'm wanting to work on, on this topic, to think that the question of territory and borders has gone away. Rather, I think the, the, the nature of those borders and the nature of the territory has changed. Um, and that's because we, there is not yet the universal community of mankind. We are able to, and it's very difficult to imagine how we would not, differentiate between different political communities. Um, and a crucial part of that way of differentiation is to do with different territories. Um, and so, that there's all of these people marching, and I, and I can see why, and I want to support them, towards global solutions for global challenges. Um, but I think if you ignore divided humanity, um, you risk just ignoring the real power imbalances, the, di the structures of inequality and so on that that, 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 that divided humanity results in. And you can't, you can't just wish it away. Um, so that, that's, that's a little bit the, the reason for coming to this topic. Thanks so much. I find the topic very uh, interesting indeed. Um, one of the things that is sort of a paradox of our time that strikes me is that I think I used to know, or at least to think I knew, what the content of being Hungarian was, according to the Zeitgeist, or what the content of being Polish was, or whatever. And I'm increasingly thinking that I don't know what the content of Hungarianness is. Because uh, what's being articulated now within Hungarian politics is not what Hungarianness is, but what it isn't, and that what uh, the only thing that you can say about what Hungarianness is is that it's sovereign, and that we decide what it is, not you. And so, and I think the message that's being sent by Brexit is quite similar. We don't know what being British is, 
And it's not, you know, that's not the question that we have to answer, but we get to decide, you don't. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting to me in that respect is this, you know, what, that sovereignty, that, you know, this crisis of sovereignty, if you will, or this perceived sense that one has to assert one's sovereignty, comes together with a hollowing out of content of what the sovereign entity is. And at the very same moment that this is happening, there's this kind of vacuum or this perception that the idea of Europe has to be filled with content somehow to account for this uh, lack. And I'm wondering, you know, like, uh, is there, are there any circumstances in which we can imagine someone saying that Europe is sovereign? Like that uh, uh, you don't get to decide we do and who that we would be and what that sovereign entity would be. And it goes back to the problem of Yugoslavia. In the 1974 constitution of Yugoslavia, it was written into the constitution, the right of secession of the constitutive republics. As long as there is an option for secession, can there be a sovereign state? Or will it always be a perpetual option to say, no, to fall back on some other entity which is unquestionable in legal terms, in, its, in terms of its sovereignty, uh, because that option is always forever possible, that, you know, some kind of regression. And I think it's interesting right now that people in the United States are starting to think about blowing up the Union, right? <laughs> Dismantling the United States. Like, what's, there's something going on here <laughs> um, with the idea that uh, of the right of secession being somehow revived in our time, which is, a, you know, like in some respects, it's kind of like an, a 19th century anti-imperial idea. So I think imperialism is interesting, but what the, the other form of that is anti-imperialism and how powerful the anti-imperialist rhetoric is acting on all of this. Because even people who were formerly imperialist pr pr present themselves as anti-imperialist in nature because that's part of the zeitgeist. And so I'm wondering if there's something that can be said about anti-imperialism in the context of this European project, not least of all because a lot of the Eastern European states formed themselves in an anti-imperial mode, and they have a very, you know, they have an idea about what Europe is. <laughs> um, and if you think of uh, like Viktor Orban, for example, his idea is quite old for what Europe is, can be, and it's one that has a conception of its boundaries and that has, you know, like, uh, and is con conceivably is a is uh, could if there if the category of Europeanness is empty, it could. Uh, come to fill the, you know, what, what it is that Europeans are and can be. Like, he has a vision for that. Um, and so, it, is the answer to that to come up with a counter vision or to question visions more generally as having some, some kind of problem? <laughs> you know, that the visionary uh, European projects are inherently imperialist at their core? Is that kind of what you want to say? Or is, uh, is the visionary somehow, does it need to outstrip the vision that uh, the current political uh, forces have and to form some kind of alternative vision? Um, I think that the, I mean there's many different things in what you said which are all which are all um, worth commenting on, but I'm not going to be able to comment on all of them. I think that the perhaps one of the ways I would put the 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 post-imperial um, nature of our uh, um, self-conceptions is not so much about whether one was on the imperial side or on the anti-imperial side, but rather that um, implicit in, in um, all attempts at constructing political identity now is a vision for how the world, or at least the nearby world, should be ordered. Um, so I think that the Brexiteers find it impossible to countenance the real existence of the European Union. They, it's not just that they're useless at negotiating, it's that they can't, under, they can't admit that something like uh, um, an entity of shared sovereignty is possible. They talk about negotiating with Germany or with France or with Spain rather than really being able to conceptualize negotiating with the European Union. Um, and that's because they have a vision of how the world should look 
um, which has some imperial elements, but also has the idea that there's political units in it, which are nation states, which negotiate amongst themselves and do international diplomacy. Um, and I think this is this is strong with 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 all of these movements. So I don't think the so I don't think it's quite correct to say that there that the um, that the nature of contemporary populism is totally empty or self-referential. Because I think that there is very often, uh, maybe there's cases where there isn't, but there is very often a vision of how the world around you should be ordered, as well as a claim that we decide here. Um, the other, but where I think that discourse is quite empty and where politics as a whole seems to be quite empty is that it's, it's, and that, is that it's very detached often from, um, from um, material issues in anything other than an individualist sense um, of social redistribution or so on. Um, but I think that these are one of the effects of, of post-war is that um, material questions about land and territory don't get posed explicitly in the ways that they might have been in, a, in, a, in, a, in an age where war was much more present. They're still with us in cases of places that were recently in war, um, but in places that weren't recently in war. Um, these, these aspects are not fully articulated. And so I think that there is, there is, is why did no one in the UK in the Brexit uh, context really think about the Irish question? It's not all just because they're in England. I mean, there are plenty of people did in Ireland. But in, but in England, um, I don't think it's just because they're imperialist or they all dislike the Irish or so on. It's that these questions seem ancient. Um, and not, they didn't seem to be questions for today. It turns out that they are, very urgently. Um, but it's this kind of abs abstraction of politics. or this, In this sense, I think it's right to say it's empty uh, or, or, or merely performative. Thank you. Hello, my name is Philippe. I am part of an NGO called Our Common Future. And we are uh, working, among other things, we are working on future governance models. Uh, we have also been cooperating with Nicolo on a project called Imagine Europe, so inviting young people, not only young people, it was open to everyone, but inviting everyone and also people not only in Europe, actually we have winners from the Philippines, for, for, for instance, so inviting people to imagine Europe in the year 2050, so to look into the further future, future because we are usually thinking about what happens next year or maybe in two or three years, but not so far ahead. Um, thank you, Nicolo, for, for your inspirational presentation. So I think at the very beginning you said that uh, you didn't think Europe was a global concept, yet at the, very, uh, at the same time, I think it raises the claim very often that many of the principles and the values that it upholds are in a way also universal. So how can we reconcile this and if we are thinking uh, in terms of global governance, so uh, maybe this could be a sign that the European Union is a uh, temporary construction. And that um, when thinking of, of global governance, um, should the European Union, for example, should it promote and more openly support the creation of other unions um, there are other unions existing, um, and then if the boundaries are not clearly set, could countries or territories, for example, belong to two or more unions at once? So in order to arrive at a more uh, a global governance world, uh, which could be, I, I'm not saying it should be, but maybe it could be the, the aim as well of the European Union if it defends uh, universal values, so we also we need to think of how to get there, and and we don't uh, claim to, of course, to to have all the solutions for everyone. So, but at the same time, we want everyone to be on board. So, could the creation of, for example, new unions or the support 
of these unions, could that be one way? Um, or would you have other ideas, maybe? I think that it's, that it's uh, useful as a, as, a, as a question to signal the fact that the, 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 the ideas which were implicit in, in creating the European Union or very present in the, the minds of various people who, who created it were, of course, plans for universal peace. Right? This is one of the traditions that the European Union is coming from. And so part of the European Union is trying to think of itself as a kind of prototype for the whole world. Um, I think that the... Um, I mean, in some sense, that's very admirable. But if you think about yourself as the prototype for the whole world, it's difficult then, I think, to really um, think politically about your relationships with um, parts of the world that are not yet part of you uh, and that are not likely to become part of you very soon. So that's to say that you, you can have an accession policy if you're a prototype for the whole world, um, but with countries that are not candidates for accession and are not likely to be anytime soon, what's your policy? Um, so then I, th it goes very much in the direction of what I think the European Union should do to uh, promote other unions and to see the ways in which they can overlap. Um, the Mediterranean Union is, is a very clear example of that, um, that overlapping with, with the European Union. But, the, but because, because of the European Union's inability to think its foreign policy, or as I would prefer to put it, the inability of the European Union to think its territory correctly, it is unable to um, develop a real strategy to work with the Mediterranean Union that doesn't actually just crush it. Uh, now, there's other reasons why Mediterranean Union these past years has been difficult. Um, but one of the reasons is that the European Union just comes in and sets its conditions, um, at, in that case, acting rather like a hegemonic um, uh, global power, uh, rather than seeing um, rather than having the finesse of being able to clearly differentiate itself from the other union and develop um, and develop policies in that space. Thank you. Uh, thank you a lot for your very thought-provoking talk. I'm Olga Bizukova. I'm junior member here, and if I may, two very short questions. Uh, first, uh, would it be productive? to think about uh, to which extent and in which conjuncture the territory and the very idea of Europe is defined and produced not only at the core, but at the margins. So by those not only who are inside, but those who are outside. Because the very historical formation of European Union, it was not unproblematic. And for example, after the fall of the communist regime, this was also the push of post-communist countries and not only the free will of the, at that time, the community. And now, of course, it's Ukraine, yes, uh, for whom probably now the Europe is, at least uh, they would like to believe it becomes closer than it's far away. And um, my second point is, um, and probably you could clarify a bit because uh, you, when you were speaking about the divisions that exist inside the European Union, uh, you were a kind of equating Europe and European Union. And uh, to this extent, uh, in, in relation to this, for example, these countries like Hungary, Poland, as far as I know, it seems um, that they score high on how population sees itself as European. And basically, this migration uh, crisis, in a way, allowed to crystallize this agenda of alternative Europe. Yes, because even uh, positioning themselves in confrontation to the European Union, they also try to promote themselves as, in a way, true Europe, whatever uh, shallow or hollow it is. So these are my two short questions. Um. And so I think I have three, three, three remarks. 
Europe and its peripheries, and is it useful to think about the peripheries? Um, yes, in the, it, and, and, and I think that the crucial question there is how can the European Union justify itself to um, people or countries that are not part of it? How does it explain itself? So this, so, and I don't think the European Union currently has an answer to that, um, to that question. But I think it's in a certain way the, the first political question. You have to be able to explain why is one community separate from another. Um, and if the only answer you have, for example, is force or walls, this is not, a, this is not an answer. Um, this is the lack of an answer. Identify, um, Europe and the European Union, I mean, of course, this is right, and it's, and it's always useful to, to, to insist that the European Union and Europe are different things. Um, you know, one of the ways of saying what I tried to indicate earlier on is that Europe as an idea uh, can be thoroughly uh, ambiguous about its territorial extent. Uh, and it always has been. Um, so for the ancient Greeks, the Lebanon, as we would currently call it, was probably part of Europe. So, um, so there is distinction there. I think that the, um, and if you look at a map, you know, typically Europe is going to look larger than the European Union. Still, I think that it is, it, I think that now the idea of Europe is in this, it cannot be thoroughly detached from the European Union. This, this name has been somehow captured. Europe has, Europa has been captured <laughs> and it's identified with a set of institutions and a bureaucracy. Um, and that might be a good thing or a bad thing, but that is the state of things. So that was the second remark. Um, do I still remember the third remark? Maybe not. <laughs> Yeah, just, just a very quick remark, thank you very much, it was really, really a good presentation, but just to play a bit the devil's advocate, or in this case the EU's advocate, um, I, I do think that yeah, we can have this insider perspective that the EU is a bit vague and uncertain about its borders. Probably Russia shared this uncertainty, that's why they like to fly within EU members, uh, uh, air spaces in, in Sweden, in, in Baltic States and elsewhere. But the joke aside, it's uh, I mean, if you are coming from an out uh, com from a country to the EU that is not a new member state, that you realize that it's a very stark reality. For example, if you come from Serbia to the European Union without uh, a new passport, then it can take you several hours of time to get in, check, and so on and so on. So the external borders of the EU are, I think, rather well, well, uh, well defended, especially in Hungary. I mean, if you want to come in as a refugee, you have to climb through meters of, of, of a fence. Um, one thing. The other thing is that, if, I mean, Schengen is something that, that at, at least a part of the European Union, I think it it's just makes, again, very important physical realities of, of where the EU's borders or part of the EU's borders end and where it begins. So um, I do think that, that and, and when it comes to the lack of, of uh, let's say, joint foreign policy and some issues, uh, I think the main reason here is that it's 28 member states that have to come to an agreement. And in a lot of cases, it was successful. For example, the EU-Turkey deal proved to be quite successful in defending the borders of the European Union uh, from part of the refugee uh, crisis. So, I, uh, uh, so I, I do think that the EU is more concrete, especially from an external perspective, than we, we tend to assume. Yes, um, I agree with all of that. The, the EU has borders. You can say where they are. Uh, specific things are happening at those borders. There's infrastructure at those borders and so on. This is, the, this is maybe not the key point. The point that what I'm trying to think about is how does the EU justify those borders? Um, and this, I think, is how, how does it justify those borders and how does it conceive of them? 
Because, um, as you rightly pointed out, they're not somehow equal borders for everybody. Some people, some things can move uh, more or less freely across them. Um, as I tried to emphasize, the, um, the borders such as they have existed up until now of the European Union have had a sort of um, inscribed uh, teleology about them in the sense that uh, some of the borders and for some of the people are not destined to last for very long because they're borders that are supposed to expand. Um, but this, uh, this is now uncertain. Um, and so these are the questions of how the, um, of how the EU should, should, th yeah, should think and justify its borders, which, which, which relate to the remark that was made earlier on about, can you, can you imagine someone saying, well, the EU is sovereign? Um, and Macron tries to build a, a discourse about this and the conditions that he makes of it, uh, which is sort of a traditional French way of thinking about um, what's a state, is well, we've got to have strong and clear borders on the outside as a condition for deeper integration, and that in that way we will have European sovereignty. Um, this to me is, is a way of thinking about the European Union which just makes it look like a big nation state. Um, and so this is reducing the, the uh, difference and uniqueness of the European Union. So yes, it can definitely do borders. Um, it already does borders in all kinds of different ways. But can it think its borders in a different way from the way nations thought of their borders? That's my question. Well, uh, since I have the mic, I would use this <laughs> opportunity uh, to, uh, to, to finish with a cynical remark. You know. Uh, since, uh, you know, uh, it was for me this uh, symptom of this extraterritoriality of the, of the EU is, of course, when uh, many farmers with their tractors come to do Brussels and, you know, literally nothing happens there because, you know, there is this uh, play of the, of the shifting uh, power, you know, because uh, only local governments are, you know, directing to the Brussels and Brussels is directing back to the government so basically eu uh, has some kind of it is uh, it is it has the territory of the all eu countries and at the same time it subtracts itself to the that point that has no territory its own like you know even vatican you know it has some <laughs> small city in the city but uh, when you come to brussels you know there is no such a thing you know and uh, well, uh, it's obviously a game of the territorialization and deterritorialization in the function of the, of the uh, game of the power, you know, uh, simple that. And you know, it's not so accidentally that it took its uh, flag, you know, these uh, stars and this blue heaven because uh, it's overlapping all the, overlap its territory is on the heaven, similarly also as the Vatican, you know, maybe. So that would be my conclusion, thank you. Yeah, I think that the, uh, clearly the, the, the Vatican is, uh, in, uh, and the Catholic Church is an interesting example to compare um, forms of political community and in their relationships with, uh, with territory. Of course, the thing with the European Union is that it's not clear whether you should go to Brussels or not. I mean, that's your point, is that you could, if you're unhappy with the agricultural policy, should you drive your tractor to Brussels? or should you drive it to your national capital, or should you drive it to all of your national capitals? Or, there's no answer to this question. That's the, that's, that's the point about the, um, yeah, the, the mysterious nature of, the, of, 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 of EU politics. Um, mystical. Mystical. Well, yeah, mystical or mythical, in, uh, like Europa. I mean, if you can find the... Princess of Europa, you can find the democratic accountability of, of the European Union. Okay, between myth and reality, you're all invited to real cheese and real wine downstairs. <laughs> uh, and uh, join me in thanking Nicolo and Grigori for their presentation.